Welcome to the Nonprofit Founders Club, where founders who have said, I have my 501c3, now what? Begins building the nonprofit they envisioned and helping the people they are called to serve, all without being the sole funder. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Nonprofit Founders Club. This episode is something that is completely different because I have a guest. Her name is Shakira Relford. She is the host of Nonprofit Unplugged, which is a podcast. I was on this podcast a few weeks ago. We had such a good time. I had to figure out how we could spend more time together. And so she is now on this podcast with us today. And a little bit about Shakira. She not only is a podcast host, but she is a founder of her own nonprofit. So that's why we have her today to talk about being a founder. And so welcome, Shakira. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And for us to connect again. This is I, fun. I know. We had such a good time the last time. I think we laughed through the whole thing. So Yes, it was great. It was great. So let's talk about you, though, this time, because we talked a lot about me last time. So tell me about you. Uh, Shakira, if I had to sum myself up in one word, I would definitely say that I'm, well, it's more than one word, but as a phrase, I would say I'm a creative soul. I have, even as a kid, always been so passionate about everything. And (laughs) I put my heart into everything. And so I definitely am one who I always, because I used to get called weird a lot when I was in elementary school and even middle school too. And I wasn't like weird as in like the weird kid to be around, but more so like you have the weirdest ideas, you know what I mean? Or you come up with the weirdest stuff, you know? And I'm like, well, yeah. And I run with it, you know? And so I have learned in my twenties, at least like, I don't know if this is what I'm feeling, I'm going to just go for it kind of deal, you know, (laughs) and see what happens. And so, yeah, I had a lot of failures out of that, but I had a lot more successes than failures. And so definitely my creative side kicks in and takes over. And I mean, I have done everything you can think of, like, dance for a professional dance company. I had five majors in my undergraduate program when I was getting my bachelor's degree. I was like a borderline 60 year student, you know, like (laughs) I had so many interests in everything, but everything boiled down to like the public health and humanities service based stuff. So I honestly, now looking back, I'm like, oh, everything led me here, you know, so I'm excited. Yeah. And I totally get that all those experiences lead you somewhere. I totally Mm -hmm. understand that. And I also get the weird kid thing. (laughs) I was the smart kid. So (laughs) So totally understand where you're coming Mm -hmm. from. That might be why we gel so well. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So now you are a founder of a nonprofit. So tell us about your nonprofit. Yes. So. My nonprofit, this is like the first of probably six that's in my head right now, but this is the first baby like I actually got to put off the press and it's called Connecting Youth Achievement Center and Consulting. Where did this come from? So it all started as my work as a behavior analyst, or really it started when I was a behavior therapist. I was working for a handful of different, not at the same time, but over the years, (laughs) working for a few different autism clinics and different types of schools, like within the school district, providing those different services for special needs and special education. And I was really sick and tired of being sick and tired of the children of color, right? Just getting that lack of care, lack of service that they needed compared to their white counterparts. And so not being biased, but just like, I feel everyone deserves, you know what I mean? When you're already at a disadvantage, right? And you have to being in special education compared to general education, you already have that barrier, even if they don't even know, but that's that one barrier that's there. And then not only that, it's like, okay, well, the school district doesn't want to make you a priority for occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech, or anything else that you can get within the school district, you know? And so I was like, this is getting old. And I want every child to have the opportunity to really 
excel in life, regardless of where they are, what's going on. And so at this point, this is maybe like six years in to the therapy role. It was just an idea then. It was just an idea, mind you. (laughs) So this is a year six and we're now at year 11 this year. So five years now, later. So that was just an idea, you know, and here we go. I continue job after job. I went to grad school by this point and graduated, you know, got my bachelor's, was in grad school, just graduated. And I had gotten a job. I was transitioning roles from one job to the next. And out of that, so when I moved to Iowa, yeah, because I was in Iowa. Oh my God, this timeline is like, what? I know there's a <laughs> lot of happening in my life, right? Because I was living in Indiana and I lived in St. Louis and here I'm in Iowa. You know, I moved like the military, but you know, so I got to here to Iowa. I started and finished grad school. So it's two years that I've been here out of the five years from the idea to now. And so it's year four into the idea. And I'm like, all right, enough is enough. Same thing was happening. Only this time, there was only like one main autism center here within the really to cover East Central Iowa. You know, mm-hmm. that's a difference of 120 miles north, south and in the far east. Right. Like that's a lot of people for one center to service so many people, kids at least. And I was like, this isn't going to work. I like them. Don't get me wrong. I love their mission. I love their passion. Don't get me wrong. But they had like at the time they had a two and a half year wait list. And I was like, okay, so you have all these kids who are needing services, can't get services. There's a two year wait list. So this is where I come in. I I said, okay, this is the time. And then the pandemic hit. So now I've been planning for this because the original name was Balanced Kids Achievement Center. Right. (laughs) So I changed the name. It was an LLC. I changed the name. I got everything together. And then when I changed the name to Connecting Youth, I was like, oh, crap. And I got to undo all this stuff. It's okay. It's the nature of the beast. But I really wanted to make it a nonprofit because I really wanted to target the marginalized and underserved communities. What happens is that, okay, so you have this large population of kids who obviously need services, behavior management services, maybe can't even get a diagnosis, right? There's a lack of insurance, a lack of care, a lack of, there's a lot of health disparities that's embedded in all of this, right? And so I was like, okay, I need to help target this health disparity. And I guess more than just being able to provide applied behavioral analytic services, it's about really the whole child, mind, body, spirit, the whole nine. At the same time, because I'm passionate, I just finished my certification in social and emotional learning, Right. My goodness. (laughs) So I was like, this is perfect. I know. I said, well, this is perfect. Let's blend it because not only are these kids not getting the help they need, they are coming from very high intensity or heavy trauma backgrounds. Let me just leave it there. So I was like, my God, this is perfect. (laughs) So (laughs) that is where Connecting Youth and really out of the name, I want my services or really my organization to be the connecting piece for the youth to achieve all of their dreams, right? That sounds like a mission statement. There you go. (laughs) There you go. I know. And and so it's easy to explain the name that way. Now, the mission statement is similar, (laughs) but different, you know, but that was really when people ask about the name, like, what? I'm like, yeah, here's the name. Because I wanted to grow into, because mind you, I'm a certified yoga instructor too. So I was growing it into, (laughs) let's have adaptive therapy. Let's have like everything that the child could need or could want or the services that you have to outsource and pay all this different money for. Just let's have a one-stop shop and just come here and get it all done. So that's really how it started. And it literally happened overnight. We'll be two years in now in September. (laughs) So yeah. (laughs) That is a lot to digest. Yeah, <laughs> <say> yeah it <laughs> is. <laughs> I think that's where I'm at. It might have felt like it was overnight, but you had, what, six years where you were formulating yeah. this. Yes, so. that's true. That's true. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, an overnight success. They're usually not overnight successes. That They've mm-hmm. been doing the drudgery work for years before they finally get noticed. So. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And it sounds like everything that you'd been doing up until then was leading you to your nonprofit. So that is really cool. So in all this time, what challenges did you face 
And how did you overcome them during your time? I think what really helped once I started the challenge is not saying it just magically went away, but because I've had like this five, six years before incorporating, I had a lot of those were the challenging years, right? Like the preliminary, <laughs> the prequel, <laughs> if you will. There's a lot of opposition of people like this isn't going to work. You're not qualified. You're not certified yet. In technicality, I had to wait for that. That's why I went back and got my master's degree because I was like, I don't want to just be the therapist coming in and out of the homes. I want to be the change maker, the policy change maker, right? I want to write the interventions, see the data come to life kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So that was my passion of even going back and getting a master's degree in this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I did it. And so I'm like, all right, wow. And I just had a baby and I got married and we moved to states and You know, there was a lot of those life challenges that happened. But had it not been for my husband in the background, like, hey, what are you doing? Don't stop. You know, keep going. Don't do this. Your plan is to be retired by 40. And I still I got seven years, guys. So I got some time. But for now, don't deviate from that. You know, and at the time I had 12 years. (laughs) So (laughs) getting closer and closer. To retirement. But retirement for me means that I am working solely for myself and not necessarily collecting a paycheck, a standard paycheck kind of deal. So you're not working for someone else. You're working for yourself. And I'm working for myself. Whatever passion you have. Right. And so that was the driving force. But I wanted to do something that didn't feel like work, even if I didn't make a dollar out of it it wasn't going to be work for me kind of deal because I actually do love what I'm doing. And I think the biggest challenge, like I said, was hearing the opposition, not allowing life to get in the way because I mean, we all have a life, get it. Things happen, family, death, positive and negative stressors can get in the way of the vision, but not actually allowing that to be the reason why you not fulfill that vision. You know, now I'm like, okay, (laughs) <laughs> we yeah. can't have this. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of founders out there who are trying to get this nonprofit started on the nights and weekends because they have a full time job because you got to pay the bills and right. there's family involved. And mm-hmm. I know some that are actually having to take care of parents and kids. And there's just a lot of life going on. And so yep. they're stealing whatever moments they can to make this dream happen. And it sounds Mm -hmm. like you were no different. No. Oh, no. I mean, a lot of the, you know how some people say they have mom guilt, you know, or like Mm -hmm. even wife guilt, or they just feel like they're working so hard and they're neglecting their family. Well, you kind of are. And that's not a lie, you know, (laughs) but you have to do these unsexy things first so you can reap the true harvest and the true benefit, right? Because what Mm -hmm. happens is this, and I see this, sometimes with clients that I work with and they're like, I have an idea and I want this idea to be a nonprofit. And I'm like, all right. And which was why I created the workbook I did. And I'm like, all right, let's do all this unsexy stuff before you even incorporate. Cause I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to smooth out a crap ton of speed bumps. Once you get started, if you do ABC, X, Y, Z first, you can have a thriving nonprofit and or at least the start of a thriving nonprofit within a few months versus several years. It just depends on how much work you're going to have to do or even want to do before you even incorporate. Let the incorporation be the reward, not getting the 501c3 status. Like, let's let the actual state filing be the game changer, like, and I mean, change the narrative, change the mindset and it will work. You will do it. We can get into that, but it really helps to narrow in exactly what your mission is going to be and the people you serve and how you are the problem solver. Now, because I already knew who I was serving, how I was going to be the problem solver. It was a no brainer. I'm like, all right, I know legally there were some things I had to get done, you know? Right. So otherwise, before I even incorporated, I knew I had to do X, Y and Z because I wanted this process to be seamless, essentially like real seamless. And so there were a lot of 24 hour days, right? Like right. days, yeah. full days. I would work a full eight to 10 hours. I come home. I think I had maybe had time to grab some cheese and crackers or maybe just cheese it. Really, it was cheese it's and sweet tea. And I sat down at the computer. 
I had two or three monitors going. I was doing this, this, and this, and this, this, and this, and this, this, and this. And so, you know, right. like to me, it was well worth it. My husband, God bless his soul. He was really helpful because at the time our daughter, I mean, we had a newborn and then she turned one and then she was crawling and getting into everything. And so it was like, yeah, <laughs> just put the pipe in right here and we'll keep her in here until she can jump out. And that didn't take long, six months, you know, yeah. so, but I just say all that to say, I learned how to make it work. And the quicker I got it done, the easier it was for me to breathe. Right. And to enjoy right. the process. Now I can enjoy my business because I don't have to think about what's going to happen next, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Well, you have staff now. Correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that's huge when you're not the only person doing it. Or you actually have a board that's helping because I know that's also mm-hmm. a complaint. Mm-hmm. So that leads us into what challenges are you still wrestling with or are currently wrestling with? And what are you learning from those experiences? Oh, my gosh. Finding people who actually want to work (laughs) (laughs) right now is, I mean, our board is small, but productive. Right. And I guess it's just founder to founder at real talk. Like we don't mean to be micromanagers. Right. But we can be really picky with who we want to bring in or introduce our baby to. Now, just think about your nonprofit is your baby. Right. It is something that you have conceived as far as the idea or the mission. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've given birth to it, especially once you've incorporated and you've gotten those bylaws together, honey, do the bylaws before you incorporate, but it helps, right? It does help to (laughs) have everything in order. And now the baby is starting to go to daycare or maybe kindergarten and the whole world is going to be exposed to your baby. And you know what you've put into the, you know, and if any of you founders have children or godchildren or stepchildren or nieces, nephews, you know, or been around kids, you know, okay, I've spent my time raising this child, instilling some morals and values, right? And think of that as your policies. You've instilled these things into that baby and someone can walk by and push that baby down. And then what? You know what I mean? So you have to trust that what you're instilling into your organization can withstand the people that's out there. That comes with having a strong mission and a strong vision. Now, for me, my challenge is not the mission, not the vision, not the board. The board found me. I didn't have to go search for them. (laughs) I was literally talking about my organization and my plan and okay, in X amount of months or weeks or whatever. And even though it may not have come to pass, I had the goal in mind, right? I was just talking, 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 talking. And the individuals who are now my board members were like, I want to invest in that. I want to be a part of this. And I'm like, you do. (laughs) Yeah. Kind of shocking. I know. I was like, you really? And they haven't left me since. They hate that. I guess their biggest complaint with me is like, you're too orderly. Like, I get that a lot. You're too organized. Like, this is good, but I wasn't expecting that. I'm like, what? (laughs) You know, how is that ever a bad thing? (laughs) I'm like, I just pay a lot of attention to detail, you know, but nonetheless, (laughs) we're now at the point where we finally got a building. You know, the board chipped in their finances and was like, hey, we got it. Let's go. And I'm like, what? So that's our new up and coming development for the summer. We're ready to launch in person because I've only been doing telehealth for now. And so now we're at the point where I'm like, "Okay, I got the job descriptions ready to go. And I actually put it out there and no one took the bait or no one qualified took the bait because I'm now I'm looking for therapists like one on one therapists. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. And I did all this work and you know how this goes. You plan for a fundraiser, right? (laughs) You plan for some event and you feel so good about it. And like five people show up or you make barely 10% of what you were expecting out of that fundraiser. And you're like, what, what I put all this work into it. And then what? And I just want to encourage you. It's not you, you know, (laughs) you know, it's the the nature of the beast. That don't mean I'm going to shut down. Because I don't have employees yet and we're planning to open in June. If I got to be the employee and the boss, I'm okay with that because at least I have help. And so it's going to work out and I'm not worried about it. But I don't want anyone to feel like 
<laughs> I can't do this. Or I have, and I hear this a lot. I have an idea for the, my nonprofit to have a building because I want to end homelessness. I hear it all the time. I've heard that too, several times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they really want the grandiose end game. And I'm like, OK, let's hustle. <laughs> like, yeah. There's nothing wrong with having that kind of goal, but that kind mm-hmm. of goes into your five year strategic plan. Right. Let's plan this out for five years down the road. And then what do we need to have happen in between now and then? Well, mm-hmm. we need mega donations. So mm-hmm. how are we going to get there? How are mm-hmm. we going to do that? I see it in the Facebook groups we're in all the time where it's like, yeah. we're brand new. We need a building. And it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's a capital campaign. <laughs> you know? yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. I've even told someone. So before I even got into nonprofit consulting, I was doing this pro bono. And again, I am a creative person. So these ideas would come in my sleep and I'm like, oh, we should do this, 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 this. And it'll work. And everyone would be like, Oh my God, that was so good. I was like, you're welcome. (laughs) But the dance company that I used to dance for a professional dance company I used to dance for, she went through a rebranding period. And at this point I'm I'm a full grown adult now and I'm not 12. Right. So I'm like, this is great. (laughs) You know, she's been in business now almost 30 years. Wow. So, you know, she went through a rebranding period. Right. And so I said, well, how about this again? The building we had, we lost kind of deal. So we're starting over. And I said, hit up the local park districts, go book a room before COVID, mind you, go book a room (laughs) at the library, go like, you don't have to have a building of your own to use some space to get started. Like, you know what I mean? Or it is okay to start small. There is absolutely nothing wrong. Right. Starting small. Right. Your funding is going to start small. So you right. might as well start small. <laughs> Just, yeah, get in that habit, get in that habit. And so I'm a stickler of it's not impossible to start. It's just actually getting started. Your start is going to look a little unconventional compared to because I think what happens is people look at Girl Scouts, right? Girls and Boy Scouts. They look at Boys and Girls Club of America. They look at, I don't know, St. Jude. They look at all of these bigger Goodwill. They look at all the bigger corporations and they're like, look at what they're doing. And I'm like, yeah, I can guarantee you they didn't just sit up and say, you know, what, let's start this and wish for all of the grant funding to just come in our lap. Like, and I worked for a nonprofit who I think this year is celebrating their 150th year Woo. in business. I think it was like 140 years at the time I was working for them. And people in the community would compare themselves mm-hmm. to that organization, but they have spent 140 years building their donor base. They've spent yep. Yep. 140 years getting those outcomes and making the impact and being known in the community for their things. That doesn't happen overnight. It's not Mm -hmm. something that you can just get on social media and go viral and all of a sudden, there you are. It doesn't happen that way. It's a slow process. Mm -hmm. Building Mm -hmm. a nonprofit is a slow process. And anyone who tells you that it is get funding quick and get going quick is trying to sell you something. Yeah. Sell you scam. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Trying to sell you a scam. Yeah. I even wrote, I put it in my workbook, how to start and scale your nonprofit within like 45 days or whatever, which is not a lie. You can start it and start the scaling process, right? right? You can. But you're starting. I never promise anyone that they're going to. You're not going to be thriving. (laughs) You're not going to be, right. (laughs) Because when I started, I mean, I've been doing all of the work myself. I mean, we've been in business for two years. And what I was doing, I do a lot of affiliate marketing, or used to, because I don't now. I completely cut all that off. Mm -hmm. But as of, once I started the nonprofit, I was like, I don't want anything else (laughs) taking up my time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, except podcasting. But I was doing network marketing and affiliate marketing programs. And all of the money I made out of that went straight to the nonprofit. All of it. Just to sit. I wasn't spending it on anything. I wasn't looking at, like, just to sit, Right. Then I started getting contracts to do the services that my nonprofit says that I do. Because right now I can't afford to hire staff. I know it's a lot of work, but I can't afford to do it. Right. So I'm going to work like a Jamaican, essentially. And so there I was. 
All right. So I'm in multiple school districts doing professional development, the whole nine and everything, keynote speaking, all this stuff and all that money straight to then the nonprofit itself got secured a contract right for ongoing services for the school year. And I was like, hell yes. So we (laughs) finally got our first, you know, 30,000. Right. Right. There was a lot of hustle. That's just for the contract. That's not including the fundraising. That's not including anything else that I've added into that revenue stream. But it's okay to think outside the box and be totally unconventional. Right. Right. That can get you results just as easy as a grant. And for me, as a grant writer, grant reviewer, I mainly do federal grants, but they want to see what you've been doing. (laughs) <laughs> right. Like, right. Yeah. They want to know what your revenue and your expenses look like. And yeah. And who in ahead. your community has right. is into your organization and right. And that you are getting funding from sources other than you or them. You know? That's right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And so now we're at the point this year, we were able to join a coalition and join a professional association and another nonprofit. Right. And so, and really get into walking out the mission, right? And now I can have other people, I would call them minions, but like I can have (laughs) other people like help fulfill that mission so I can focus on being that executive director and just solely doing that and not 17 other jobs. But if you start with 17 other jobs, if you got to do 17 other jobs, chunk it up. One day I'm an exec. Next day, I'm an admin. Right. The following day, I'm going to be a volunteer. Next week, I'm going to do, you know, just chunk it up. Don't do everything in one day, every day. And that's yeah. one thing I had to learn. Yeah. And that's a great tip because it doesn't matter what you're doing. That, that's mm-hmm. a great tip because mm-hmm. if you put together activities that are the same kind of thinking, the same kind of doing. hmm you can get it done so much quicker and so much faster than if you try and be all things in one day, because you'll find your mind has to switch to more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that is. And, such and, a and things tip. get messy, right? Mm-hmm. Things get messy and unorganized. And I literally wrote out tasks like a task analysis checklist. And I'm like, OK, I need to get four targets done today. And that's it. And that target could take me five minutes. It could take me 20 minutes. It could take me two hours. It could take me. Six hours. But once I hit that target, I'm shutting it off, going to bed. That's it. But that was, again, <laughs> that wasn't until after I incorporated. So like that four or five years right. <laughs> where I was really slaving and trying to do research, research, research and research my market, my competition, and also think of ways to collaborate with them because we don't compete. We complete. Right. It's it's a good thing to complete each other, not compete with each other. There's going to be some competition because they are your competition. There's a healthy range of competition, but you can always find that one common denominator. You'll be surprised because you're tapping into their network and their network is like, hey, who are you? You like them. I like them, too. I'll support. It happens all the time. So. Right. Yeah. And I find in nonprofit work, there is a large segment out there of people that work in nonprofits who have that scarcity mindset. It's everyone's competition. There's only Mm. so much funds. There's only so much of this and so much of that. And so I have to silo and hoard everything I have because there's such scarcity in the world. But I have found those founders and those organizations that saw the abundance Mm -hmm. out there that said, you know, there's enough for all of us if we use it wisely. Right. They have just completely gone above and beyond in their nonprofit growth Mm -hmm. and all of that. So I think that's another good point that you're bringing up, that we should be looking at ways to complete each other instead of really looking at the scarcity and what's mine's mine and what's mine's mine. (laughs) Right. Right. And that comes from, I think, a survival mentality. You know, this is just anything when it comes to my philosophy in life. When you are not meddling into everybody else's business, you know exactly how to mind your own and your grass will forever be greener than everyone else because you're not in everyone else's grass trying to figure out 
how come you have weeds in that section out over there? How come, what are you doing? It's like, focus on you, focus on your organization, your mission, et cetera. And trust me, you'll look up, time would have gone by and you wouldn't have realized, whoa, everyone is looking at you now and you're not in everyone else's business or that's only going to kill your organization. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. Constantly looking and trying to figure out what everyone else is doing or what they're not doing. Let it go. Just, yeah. just worry about you, what you have in your back pocket and perfect that. Don't be perfect, but just yeah. work on getting better. You'll be fine. And yeah, that's that whole stay in your lane kind of mindset. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's so true. If you start trying to compare yourselves to other organizations, especially the 140 year old organizations. Right. Or the national organizations. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You are going to come up short because you are not at that level. But if you keep your head down and you focus, then yeah, you will definitely get there. <laughs> All right. So in the Nonprofit Founders Club, one of our values is purpose. We believe that not only everything we do has purpose, because otherwise it's called busy work, but we also have a purpose in this world. And for many founders, their life purpose is entwined in their nonprofit. So I'm going to ask you the question that I got from you. (laughs) (laughs) What is your life purpose and have you stepped into it? Yes and yes. (laughs) <laughs> yes and yes and then yes and no and here's why so <laughs> my mom used to say and she doesn't say it as much maybe because she's much older than me now but she used to say growing up like no one ever dies or leaves this world without fulfilling their purpose you may not know what that purpose is but you don't die until you can complete it and sometimes it takes for you to pass for it to click, maybe not you, because you've already gone on, but for other people to recognize truly what that purpose is, you know, and I always live my life of when I die, what are people going to say about me? What would I be known for? What would that legacy be? And honestly, I've always believed this, even though I was in high school, I have just a funny way of getting into someone's like passions and like, oh, turning it up a notch and like pushing them off the cliff. I'm that person who, if you want an accountability partner, I am going to say, oh, great. I'll come alongside you and I'll rub your back. You're going to fly and you're going to soar and you're going to excel. My purpose is to inspire you and to inspire others, right? To live their purpose, live their life on purpose with purpose, right? Whatever that purpose may be. It could be basket weaving. It could be what we're doing in the nonprofit world, it could actually be like nursing or being a lawyer or whatever. If it brings you true joy, not just makes you feel happy. Joy is a feeling that can't nobody give and can't nobody take it away. Yeah. The world can't give it and the world can't take it away. So if you can get that gut wrench and joy, that true fire That literally, no matter how old you are or no matter what happens, it can never die. It may dim, but it won't go away. It won't just blow out. Run with that. Regardless of your age, regardless of your socioeconomic status, this idea, I was homeless, engaged, but homeless, you know, (laughs) and I was like, hey, what you going to do? I know there's greater out there for me. So what you going to do? And really. Stepping into the nonprofit world, I was 21. That was my first job within college, right? Not my first job ever, because I've been working since I was 12. So by the time I was 21, I was ready to retire. So (laughs) I had gotten my first real job, right? Career wise job working in a nonprofit, substance abuse, doing data. I was a data analyst for them. I didn't think I was going to love numbers so much. I'm like, now I went from a data analyst to a behavior analyst, right? Ah, this is great. (laughs) But you just like the analyst. (laughs) I'm the analyst, yes. I love to explore, do the research, and then present the car facts, right? You can't argue with the car facts. (laughs) But I stepped into this still with questions, right? What am I doing? And then I loved it. And then it was like, okay, how can I expand? And you've heard my story. What? Tell us about your nonprofit. Oh, so that whole story was transpiring during this time. I don't understand the vision all the time, but I know who's leading me 
to where I'm going, right? right. And I have to trust that and trust that wherever I'm going, that's exactly where or who or what I'm meant to be doing, you know? Right. And the whole journey, as I'm down, I'm still inspiring others. I have never been able to see the glass half empty. I never had the ability to see the glass half empty. And <laughs> to me, that's a gift, right? And I don't yeah. allow other people in my space to focus on their glass half empty. Literally all but one of my friends, I would almost consider them to be pessimists. I love them dearly. And if you listen to this, you know I love you dearly. And you already know I've told you this. But I don't ever let them focus on what didn't work, what didn't happen, what isn't going right. If the glass was half full, how can we fill it up? And let's pour into that. Literally, let's pour into that. If that glass over there is half empty, how can you pour into and make it full? So, yeah, I'm walking in that purpose. But I say no, too, because I'm not dead yet. So I still have a lot more purpose left to give and left to live. And that's the beauty of it all. Yeah, And you don't know exactly what that purpose completely is, do you? Right. Because I'm only 33, y'all. Like, I'm young. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, I, that's I, something I we didn't talk about. You are so young. You're a baby. I, am, <laughs> yes. I have, Lord willing, if I knock on wood, I have a long way to go. My dream, and I always say this, I said, Lord, please let me live to be 100. Like, if I died the day after my birthday, my 100th birthday, I would be content. Like, I want to see a full 100 years of my life and what happens within my 100 years of life. And so far, I'm not the most impressed as far as worldly events goes. <laughs> I'm not the most impressed, but I can say I lived through that. And just thinking about all the experiences that can come and how I can use those experiences even as a beacon of hope or inspiration. So I've thought about it. I said, Lord, what would I do with my nonprofit And that was another reason why I started a nonprofit, because I don't know how my daughter is going to grow up. She might grow up to be a greedy little girl. Who knows? But I don't want her. (laughs) I don't want to leave anything to her that she feel like she can get her hands on. And I'm like, a nonprofit (laughs) is perfect because you're not going to be able to get there that easy. Right. You're going to have to work for it. huh? You're going to work for it. (laughs) And you're never going to be a millionaire. (laughs) Right. So I was like, this is great, (laughs) to be honest. But no, I thought about like, what would I do when I die? What what happens to it? Right. It could be like, I don't know. I could be as influential as, you know, Milton Hershey, you know, or Ikea even, you know, or whatever, you know, my (laughs) connecting youth can really live on. I don't know yet, but I'm glad I'm in this journey. I'm glad I activated right or started to plant the seed because I only expect the best for my baby and if my baby doesn't go no further than the ceiling at least I started yeah at least I started at least you tried yep Mm -hmm. well to wrap this up tell us how we can find out more about you and you mentioned a workbook so Tell us about how to get our hands on that workbook, because I'm sure there's people that whose ears perked up and was like, "Ooh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can find me on Facebook at Shakira Relaford. You can find me on Clubhouse at Shakira Relaford. You can find Nonprofit Unplugged, the podcast on all podcast directories and the workbook <laughs> is so much fun. I'm so proud of the colors. Like I really wanted to make this this cool little color scheme, but the workbook <laughs> <laughs> definitely walks you through what to do before you actually file for the 501c3, right? Because filing for the 501c3 is different than the articles of incorporation. <laughs> and so before you even file anything, right? I walk you through exactly step-by-step what to do. I think there's seven main steps, but each step has sub steps and it's an interactive workbook. So you can work on it digitally and of course, print it out and actually hand write it all in, but you can find the workbook for free, by the way, at www.nonprofitunplugged.com forward slash workbook. All right. And we'll make sure we get that in the show notes too. Mm -hmm. So you can check the show notes out to get all that good information. Yes. Shakira, thank you so much for being here and being thank my you. first interview guest. That is so Yay! exciting. <laughs> <laughs> 
And as usual, we had such a good time. Yes, I'm excited. I, I love. Thanks for having me, Joe. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I absolutely love listening to you and your experiences and just your joy and your encouragement. And you just have that spirit about you that when we get off this, I will feel so good for days. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for the Nonprofit Founders Club podcast. Hit subscribe so you won't miss the next episode. In the meantime, keep building your nonprofit so you can help those you are called to serve.